rocks and statues, what do they have in common? Uh, believe it or not, a lot. Um, what I'm gonna hear, what I'm here to share with you today is some ideas of business and some ideas of government and their roles in respective society through the lens of a slice of history which up until recently has not been very well known. Everyone here thinks they know the story of Rome, two orphan brothers suckled by a she-wolf who created one of the world's greatest empires. Uh, the physical legacy of these great feats of engineering uh, remain with us to our present day, but not just the physical legacy, also the social legacy, the political legacy, the form of what the Romans called res publica, inspired in many ways our own system of government. And over the next couple of centuries, this formed the world's, great, the world's first superpower, a super state that encompassed pretty much all the known world. The idea what I would share with you today is that what made these great feats of engineering, what made these great the, these, uh, political structures possible was one of the world's earliest, most advanced, and most innovative financial infrastructure, the world's first capital markets that up until very recently was not known. So what stacks and statues have in common is that they both originated in the ancient Rome, in the uh, ancient Roman Republic. This is a rather strange topic, and I don't blame you if you ask you know, how I came upon this. Well, the truth is actually very simple. Uh, about five years ago, uh, I was by day working at one of Wall Street's greatest investment banks, which I still miss, and at night studying at Columbia University in their departments of history and economics. And I thought, you know, I'm working with stocks today, and at night I'm studying history and economics, and wouldn't it be great if I could combine them into my senior thesis? And that is precisely what I did. Um, our story begins in the year 390 BC. You have this vision of Rome as this place of magnificent statues and temples and, and all these grand structures and plazas and avenues. No, for, for a long time it was this miserable hill with not much on it. But what happened in 390 BC was Rome was invaded and burned to the ground by a Gallic tribe. They were called the uh, Senones, and they came from what is now Germany. Uh, Germany has a long history of harassing Rome. Anyone read the papers lately? But anyway, uh, uh, what happened was all of Rome was burned to the ground except for one hill, the Capitoline Hill. There were geese on the top of the Capitoline Hill, and one night, uh, when the Romans were sleeping, uh, the Germans started approaching the hill at the cover of night, and the geese started honking. They woke up all the Roman soldiers who were guarding their last redoubt, who mounted the defense and drove off the Sinones. And the first thing, what do you think the first thing was the Romans did after they repelled this attack? They were Romans. They put up a statue to the geese. Really. This is still the statue on top of the Capitoline Hill. But the second thing they did was they let contracts they hired private businessmen on a contract basis to feed the geese into perpetuity. What they also did at the same time, was around the same time, was let contracts to build temples uh, to give thanks. So we know that from the very earliest days of the Roman Republic, uh, giving private contracts to private businessmen was a well-accepted practice. We know that it was uh, done for a whole range of tasks, from the mundane, feeding geese, to the monumental, building temples. And we also know that there was apparently no stigma attached to trusting to these private businessmen, again, the right, the, the right to do uh, works of immense civic and religious importance. And over the next few centuries, these private businessmen, which became known as the Publicani, would indeed uh, engage in many acts of great civic importance, including, uh, at this point, they were, became known as the Societas Publicanorum, the Society of Publicans. Uh, the, a member of this society was known either as a socius or a publicanus. And what they owned in the societas was known as partes, from which you know, you, we derive the word parts. And for many, many years, we had no idea what these partes were. A well-known ancient dictionary uh, very helpfully defined them as what a socius held in a societas publicanorum. That's it. And so it became incumbent upon us to figure out what these were, and that was the topic of my research. Over the next few years, we found that uh, they, again, engage in many, many of these uh, monumental acts, including bridges, including roads, aqueducts, uh, temples and civic buildings. Uh, they supplied the Roman army. They built parks. Uh, and they ran the fire service of Rome, which was a very, very bad idea. Uh, what happened was one particular publicanus uh, would run these fire engines around Rome, which at that time was made largely of wood. And when the building started burning down, he'd show up in his fire engine and charge the owner an exorbitant price to put out the fire. And if the owner refused to pay, he would wait till the burning build, bur building burned down and then buy the land. Uh, what they also did was, and finally, most infamously, tax farming or tax collecting. This was, again, a very, very bad idea. 
what they would do is the uh, Roman state would auction off the right to collect taxes in a certain province to the highest bidder, who would raise a private army, go out and you know, ravage the country side and oppress the people and collect taxes. And as long as he remitted what he bid for the right to do it, he could keep, the, the, uh, he could keep what was left. But when we're looking at this angle, it becomes very obvious that some questions come to mind. Obviously, a one person, one wealthy individual, one wealthy family could finance the building of a road or a bridge. But what about supplying the army? What about tax farming when you pretty much need your own army in order to collect taxes? There arises the need to be able to pool capital, to share your risk, and to limit your liability. And so what we found in many of the writings of the ancient Romans were these three revolutionary ideas, three revolutionary innovations that formed the basis of what we now know as a stock market. The first is the idea of, uh, of ownership subdivision, the fungible subdivision of ownership. This very youthful, very healthy looking young man is known as Cato the Elder. He was a horticulturalist, he was a senator, he wrote books on farming and cooking, which are still read today apparently. But what he also did was he was a shipping magnate. There, in his biography by Plutarch, he says that you know, he formed these companies that would ship things back and forth between Rome and Greece. And from the very beginning, we see that he's saying, you know, this, this shipping enterprise where you need a lot of ships is very expensive. So he formed a company with 50 partners. He would take one share, and that way he was able to spread his risk out and pool the capital of the partners. What we also found is that uh, Cicero, in his speeches, when he asked people uh, what's going on, he, he explicitly asked, when you bought a share in this company, was it for a half a share, or did you buy the entire company? The second great uh, innovation, the second great idea that we found in that area is the idea of limiting liability. That means that when you are able to buy a stock in a company or whatever, uh, your risk is limited, your liability is limited to the amount you put in. If the company goes bankrupt, you're not personally affected. This is, a, this is a protection that is integral in our modern day and age to get people to take risks and invest in these, uh, these enterprises. And the Romans were actually extraordinarily progressive when it came to, uh, in, when it came to limiting the interests of government on the state. Uh, the, their, from the very earliest days, their senators were forbidden from insider trading. They were forbidden from engaging in the affairs of these publicans. And how progressive was this? So from the very earliest days, their senators were forbidden. We just passed this ban three months ago. But in all the writings we found, you know, we find a lot of very prominent disembodied marble busts, such as Julius Caesar, Pompey Magnus, Marcus Tullius Cicero, and Marcus Licinius Crassus. Um, he's the guy who ran the private fire department. Not coincidentally, a couple years later, he became one of the largest landowners of Rome. We found these people who were forbidden from engaging in transactions with the Republicans, nevertheless holding enormous shares. And we think the way that they were able to do it was that these shares were anonymous. No one knew who held what. And because they were anonymous, they granted a form of limited liability. You could not hold these people liable uh, for, for the actions of a company because you didn't really know who they were. Nonetheless, with the, uh, with the share certificate or some proof of ownership, they could claim a share of the profits that were earned. The third great revolutionary innovation that we found at the time, or we found evidence of at the time, was the idea of market-determined prices. Namely, a share of a company or the share of a property is worth what you think it's worth based on your assessment of the quality of its management and its business prospects. For many, many years, we thought that the earliest this had happened, this had taken place, was in Amsterdam. This is, uh, this is what we think is the world's first stock exchange, the Borsa Amsterdam. Where, which was built in 1608 and had the revolutionary innovation of continuously updating bid and ask prices. So there would be someone in there who would continuously write down what someone was willing to pay for something and continuously write down what someone was willing to pay for something. And with very, very few exceptions, this is how our stock markets today worked. And yet, at that time in ancient Rome, in what is now the, in what is the Temple of Castor, we are told multitudes of men, multitudes, would come by to talk about companies and transaction their shares and to be able to, uh, to, to trade in these, these companies. So already at this point, we have the foundation of what is a very impressive system of equity financing, which frankly wouldn't see the light of day for another thousand years. We have the idea that they would pool capital, that they would limit their risk, that they would limit their liability, that they would diversify, that they would be able to trade, that they would, and, and so on and so forth. And this in itself is pretty impressive. But we found indeed more, many more, much, so much, in, in fact, we found some innovations that wouldn't be widely practiced in this country until the 70s and 80s. We found private equity. 
Remember Cato the Elder? Healthy, young looking individual? Well, what you read into this his uh, particular transaction is that this money that he used to make his, to form a shipping company was borrowed money. And as a result, this is the world's first leverage buyout from around 200 BC. What we also found were derivatives. One of the biggest businesses known at the time which Republicans engaged in was shipping. The sh trade route from Rome to Greece was one of the most heaviest traffic routes in the world. It also took three months for a shipment of stuff to get from Rome to Greece. And it also took three months back for word to come back that your ship had actually come through and your goods were sold. And during those three months, anything could happen. You could run into storms. Uh, Rome was traditionally not a seafaring society like Greece, so their ships were not very well built. They would often sink. Uh, you could run into pirates. Uh, pirates was a big problem. <laughs> and in fact, uh, there, was some, there was a comment somewhere that there's only a 50% chance that your ship would make it through to Greece, uh, which would take three months. And you wouldn't find out if it made it through until three months after that, so six months in total. And if by some miracle you made it through you know, storms and pirates, again, you had to wait another three months for a word to come back. And if that guy stopped, got stopped by storms and pirates, you were in deep, deep trouble. And so we find that from the very earliest days, again, 215 BC, that there were derivative contracts, contracts to insure yourself against storms and pirates, which you could use to hedge your risk and be able to still be able to, you, it's, it's a form of insurance, and still be able to uh, you know, operate your business. And we find this because a publican bought an insurance contract onto a ship, then loaded these four rotting hulks with scrap metal, and then when they conveniently sunk a few days later, showed up and said, hey, I want to, you know, my, my ship was seized by pirates or were founded in a storm, um, I, I like my payout now. They had obtinete wallum weum. Anyone know what this is? Occupy Wall Street. There were numerous, numerous instances throughout the late republic of the dispossessed, the landless, rising in revolt against the well-landed, the wealthy senators. The most famous is the, one, is the revolt of Catiline. He's a reviled figure throughout Roman historiography. But what he did was he was, uh, he was a prominent senator who lost his land, who lost his office, who gathered up other like-minded individuals, people who had lost their lands, lost their businesses, lost their properties. And he built an army in the countryside in revolt against the Romans. And he gave a very, very interesting speech, according to Sallust's Chronicle where he says, you know, look at these senators, they're so wealthy, they're so rich, they have these houses, they have these gardens, they have these parks, they have horses and, and all these, you know, they have fleets, they have riches. Who in the world indeed that has the feelings of a man can endure that they should have a superfluidity of riches? But for us, there's poverty at home, debts abroad, our present circumstances are bad, our prospects are much worse, and what in the world have we left but a miserable existence? He then led his army, his poorly armed army of the landless and the dispossessed into battle and was promptly killed. By the time of the New Testament, these publicans were universally reviled throughout the empire. And in fact, they were mentioned in the same breath as sinners in the book of Mark. So what happened to them? Well, by the time Augustus Caesar came to the throne around the first century BC, he realized that they were getting way too powerful. They were collecting taxes. They were supplying the army. They were building bridges, aqueducts. They were doing everything, in short, that a government should be doing. And so he began to supplant them. He would send out his own tax collectors. He would send out his own bridge builders. He would, send out, he would set up his own you know, uh, arms factories and so on and so forth to supplant these publicans and replace them. And so by the end of the first century BC, uh, sorry, the first century AD, they were gone. Their power had been completely diminished. So what message, if any, do we take from this? I would share with you a few thoughts. First is, this enormous, creative, innovative force shaped physical institutions, political institutions, and economic institutions, many of which last with us to our present day. But when they became too powerful, they took over many of the legitimate functions of government. For example, collecting taxes and running the army. And the corruption was unbelievable. Think about the guy who ran the fire department, whose job it was to put out fires, but instead would use it to you know, wait for people's houses to burn to the ground and buy up the land at a discount. Or think about the person who abused the capital markets by saying, okay, I'm gonna buy shipping insurance against storms and pirates, but then when my ships sink because they're made of rotting wood and scrap metal, I'm gonna claim a payout. Or, or, think, of, or think of any, the, the history is full of these particular examples. And the social effects of such wealth inequality led to a Rome that for centuries verged between civil war and dictatorship. 
But on the other hand, when the government overreached at the time of Augustus, when they expropriated property, they shut down one of the greatest, most innovative, most creative forces known in the ancient world, which lay dormant for another thousand years. So what I'd like everyone to take away from this today is reject either dogma. There is a role for business. There is a role for government. Understand what businesses do. Understand what governments do. Be vigilant and be informed and always ask questions. If you see a business doing things that it hasn't done before or you don't think it should be doing, ask why. If you see the state doing things it hasn't done before or you don't think it should be doing, again, ask why. Never be afraid to ask. The Roman philosopher Seneca uh, once wrote, qui fortis est, liber est. He who is brave is free. Be brave and stay free. Thank you.